Right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thanks to our speaker today. This is the first CNS talk uh, in 2023. And we're going to start with taking you all out of your comfort zone a little bit with a talk about what chimps can tell us about aging. And I'm super excited to have Serene here today with us. As you can see from the background, we are leaving our safe environment of MR imaging for now. Um, and Serene is currently, and I'm sorry, I have to read this because it is a mouthful, <laughs> Use Family Career Development Professor at Tufts University for Anthropology and Biology. Mm -hmm. That is a long time, so probably the it's winner long time. in the room. <laughs> Well, without any further ado, thank you so much for being here. Super excited. And I give the floor to you. Well, thank you, Stephanie. It's been a long time in the making, this talk. So um, I'm very happy to be here. And it is going to be a different talk today because I am not a neuroscientist at all. And I don't study clinical neuroanatomy in any way. But I think hopefully you'll see some ways that what we're doing might inform what you're doing and vice versa. So let me uh, get my screen ready and I have to do a little bit of uh, moving things around. So be patient. And I know you're seeing some bars, but hopefully those will go away in a second. So Stephanie, if you can tell me when you things are looking good on your end, I can get started. It's looking perfect on my end now. Okay, wonderful. Um, so. Uh, like Stephanie said, I'm here to tell you a little bit more about chimpanzees and their behavior, especially in the wild, and the work that we're doing to inform kind of studies about human aging and what we can understand about human aging from our closest living relative. And many of you will know that studies of human aging are incredibly important, but also there, there's a lot of work done on aging, especially things about our, how our brains are aging and um, our cognitive abilities. And in many ways, this is because humans are living longer lives than ever before. And so this is becoming a real kind of topic of medicine and understanding the aging process. But a lot of research focuses on the pathology of aging, thinking about diseases related to aging like Alzheimer's. And in many ways, I think even as a society, we think about aging as this pathology or this kind of bad thing that's happening about, happening to us, all of the kind of negative aspects of aging. And we really kind of conceive of aging in this way of like all of the things that we're losing, all of these changes that are happening to us that are bad. And what I want to do today in this talk is kind of think about maybe a model for healthy aging. And I am essentially, uh, I'm a biological anthropologist. I'm someone who thinks about kind of the, the evolutionary trajectory of humans. And what we wanna think about from an evolutionary perspective is that maybe the things that are happening to us as we age are actually part of a natural and maybe healthy aging process. And the way that I approach this is to think about our closest living relatives. What are, what can wild chimpanzees tell us about how they age? Where are the similarities and differences with how they age and how we age? And maybe we can start to think about the changes that are happening to our brains and bodies and behavior as part of an adaptive strategy that aging process, but also kind of maintain a healthy lifestyle. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convince you that there are, that chimpanzees can be a model for human aging, but also for us to think about healthy aging and what might be part of a natural process of aging. And from, an, sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, we definitely kind of think about primate data as being important to understand the things about humans that make us unique. We can really only say something about humans are, we can only say things about humans are unique if we have a comparison. And I would make the argument that chimps, and in many ways are, are the other close living relative of, of humans, bonobos, the data that we have from chimps are incredibly essential in terms of being that comparison point. And there are a lot of things about chimps even compared to uh, other primates like lemurs or baboons or macaques 
that are kind of more similar to how humans live than these other primates and other mammal models. So like humans, chimps have these this incredibly long period of development, both in utero, but also a long period of infancy. They're infants till they're about five, so they're nursing till they're about five. And then they don't hit adolescence until they're about somewhere between 10 and 15. But from the aging perspective, one of the things about chimps is that they do live till they're, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60. Our oldest living chimp in the wild was probably about 62 when she died. And we routinely have chimps in the wild that live past the age of 50. And a chimp ends up being adults, they become an adult when they're about 15, and then they die somewhere in their 50s, a lot of them. And so they have this incredibly long period of adulthood like we do. Now, chimps don't have this long post-reproductive period that humans do. You know, they don't live three decades past reproduction, but they certainly live decades after the prime of their life. And we often think of chimps as reaching this kind of prime period of their life when they're the most beautiful and muscly and dominant around the age of 30. But then once they hit about 35, we start to see some declines and they still have to live with that kind of old body for about two decades. And so it's kind of interesting that we have at least this comparison of multiple decades of living in what we would think of as old age. And there are a lot of shared traits across uh, chimps and humans. And I think, you know, it, especially as I already pointed out, they have these long lives, but as you know, they also have some of the largest brains for their body size of any other mammal. And one of the things that we think they use these large brains for is to make very complicated, to have very complicated social behaviors, very complicated lives. They're an extremely social animal. And I often, I'll, I'll show you some of our data, but I mean, some of their, you know, some of the stories we have are these generational decades long kind of soap opera stories that are incredibly complicated. The reason that I think wild chimps might make a good model for aspects of social aging that even kind of outdo what you might know, what we might have about humans, is that when we're thinking about aging, one of the problems or one of the challenges with human data sets and aging is that there are these kind of complex cohort effects with humans that we don't see with chimpanzees. And what I mean by that is, for example, if we wanted to compare um, 80 year olds with 20 year olds for humans, we have this problem that all 20 year old humans have lived their li their, the entirety of their lives with social media and the internet. Whereas these old adults did not grow up with that kind of technology. And so when we're comparing aspects of their behavior, it's very hard to control for that kind of cohort effects, these worldwide cohort effects. Other things that might be examples of cohort effects in studies of humans when you're looking across the human lifespan are things like just world wars, where there are these generational effects on the way that people behave that you can't really control out of a human study in the same way. Now, chimpanzees have these long complex lives, but they don't have those kinds of technological cohort effects or these kind of like worldwide catastrophic effects that we might see in humans. So in many ways as a model organism, we can use the similarities that chimps and humans have, these long lives, large brains being extremely social, but without the cohort effects to say things about the aging process. And uh, as part of my job, yes, I'm a professor, but I'm also the director, uh, one of the directors of a long-term chimpanzee research site in Uganda called the Kibali Chimpanzee Project. And we study the Kanyawara community of chimpanzees that live in Kibali National Park, Uganda. And this was a field site that was started by my PhD advisor, Richard Wrangham in 1987. And since 1987, we have collected daily records of the, of the chimps uh, with uh, the only break we've ever had is actually due to COVID in March, 2020, where we suspended data collection for about six months. But 
for the most part, we have these daily records of the lives of this one group of chimpanzees. I'd just like to point out that today, there are four of us who direct this site, myself, and Melissa Emery Thompson and Martin Muller, who, at the, who are at the University of New Mexico. And so this is very much a shared kind of project and we do this work together. And I thought I would get you in the mood since many of you probably work in the lab. Um, I thought I'd get you in the mood of what it's like to do some wild chimpanzee field work. Um, one of the amazing things about studying the same group of chimps for over 30 years is that they are incredibly well habituated to human presence. And so they're so well kind of, they're so used to us that we can even climb into the trees with the chimps and if, if we want to and collect data on them. So I thought I'd get you in the mood because this is a great kind of view of chimpanzees in a feeding tree. And you'll also see what the forest looks like behind them and the sounds of the forest. I'll just warn you, this video can get a little loud because there's some social behavior here and chimps are not known for being quiet. So what uh, we're in, at, we're in this video, we're in a uh, fig tree. This is a ficus capensis tree. And we're probably about 40 meters off the ground. And um, you'll actually see a number of chimps and you'll even see a dominance interaction. The alpha male is in the center of this video right here. And he moves and just his movement actually kind of causes one of the lower ranking males to do a very emphatic kind of um, sig uh, signal of submission. Hopefully that got you in the mood and you can see we're surrounded by chimps. Now, um, it's a little bit of a process to actually climb, climb the trees with the chimps, so we don't do it very often. And chimps spend about 50% of their waking hours in trees feeding, and the other 50% of their time is on the ground. And we on the ground can actually get incredible detail about rich social interactions. We can do that in the trees as well, but it's mostly us looking up at them uh, with binoculars. And this is an example of kind of a social interaction that we might see on the ground. Uh, here we have Kakama, who at the time of this video was the alpha male. And you're gonna see him, he's a little puffed up. He's trying to look intimidating. And he walks past a low ranking male named Tuke. And again, you'll see Tuke give this very emphatic signal that we call a pant bark. And that's a signal that Tuke is giving to Kakama to say, I know I'm not dominant to you. Please don't beat me up. I submit. And so you'll see just kind of some nice social behavior. <laughs> So we can recognize every single one of our chimps by their faces or their bodies. They're all, always kind of characteristic features of a chimp. Um, at any given time, we have somewhere between 50 and 60 individuals in the community. And we've known almost all of them since the day they were born. So we do have these kind of rich histories of these chimps. At least that's true for the males. Females come into the group. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about just the general aspects of their behavior to put some of the data that I'm going to show you into a bigger context. So chimpanzees actually have, in many ways, a, a somewhat unique social system among primates. There are a couple of primates that do have the same social system, but chimps live in groups of many adult males and many adult females. And like I said, we have about 60 chimps in the community that we study, but chimpanzees have something that we call fission fusion social organization. And I'll tell you more about that in a, in a few slides. But what this means is that you never actually see all 60 chimps together. In, instead, what they do is they form kind of small temporary subgroups throughout the day and, and come and go and, and make choices about who they wanna spend time with. 
And that's actually a very, that's actually what humans do, right? So we exhibit fission fusion. And after we get off Zoom today, many of us are going to go in separate directions and, and form other temporary subgroups. Chimps are frugivores. The majority of their diet is ripe fruit, although they certainly enjoy other vegetation like leaves and and seeds. Um, and then occasionally they certainly will hunt and kill and eat monkeys and other meat that are in the habitat with them. Chimps exhibit male phylopatry, which means that the males who are born in the group stay and grow up in that group. Females who are born in the group will leave the group and join another group around the time of adolescence. So somewhere between the age of 10 to 13, females that are born in our group will kind of just disappear and we don't often know where they go. Um, and what this means is that males are in groups with more of their kin, so their brothers and fathers and uncles, whereas females are in groups with non-kin and with strangers. And the effect of this is that males tend to have stronger social bonds with each other than females do. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, females around the time of ovulation have swelling of the labial tissue for about 10 days. They ovulate around day six, seven, or eight, but for this 10 day period, they have this sexual swelling and it results in incredible kind of male attention over these swollen females. So just to kind of tell you a little bit more about fission fusion, um, so chimpanzees are living in a community, many males, many, many females, they defend a community range, sometimes uh, through the action of killing their neighbors. And at any given time, you might have one or two females who have a sexual swelling. Now, chimpanzees commu communities can be small, even smaller than 30 individuals, and even sometimes as large as 250, although those tend to be so big that they end up splitting into two communities eventually. And what we mean by fission fusion is that within the community, within the community range, chimpanzees form these temporary subgroups called parties. And these can be of varying size. If there's a swollen female, that usually attracts a lot of males. So you get these big parties around a swollen female. Uh, females are often much more solitary and so are in parties of one or at least parties with them and just their dependent offspring. And throughout the day, what you'll see is that these parties kind of reform, these temporary subgroups break up and reform. And for the purposes of this talk, one of the important kind, kind of results of this kind of social organization is that chimpanzees, unlike a lot of other primates, have choice have kind of more robust choices about who they want to spend time with. So if you're a chimp and Fred is driving you crazy, you can just leave and you don't have to spend time with Fred. And there are certainly chimps that may go months without seeing each other, and which is you know, kind of different from what you see with other primates where they're just, they always are together. So I, like I said, I helped direct this long-term field site. And that means that we have a permanent staff of trained Ugandan field assistants who are going into the forest every day. They start with the chimps before they wake up at night and then wait till they go to bed um, at the end of the day. And we take multiple kinds of data, and I'm just going to quickly walk you through some of the data that we collect. Um, but essentially, one of the field assistants f picks an individual for the day and follows them for the entire day and records what that individual is doing every minute of the day for probably about a 12-hour day. So pretty intense data collection. And it, we record who they're, who they're with, who they're doing things with, who they're grooming, um, any copulations, all aggression, just a very detailed account of every single day of, you know, for, for each of these focals. And we try to do a focal follow of every chimp in the community every month, including all infants all the way up to our oldest adults. We also have a second field assistant who collects really detailed kind of a handwritten narrative of everything the chimps are doing. And I'll show you some of that data in a second. And that data goes back to 1987. Um, and then since about the mid 90s, we've taken extensive data on health and physiology. And I'll tell you about that. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more detail about all of this. My job is to take all of this long term data, digitize it, uh, put it into tables and then keep it in a relational database where we can kind of query these things all together. 
So this is an example of some of our handwritten notes. And you can see, I mean, it really is like, you know, I always think this is probably what Darwin did, you know, pen to paper. So we are very old fashioned and I'll um, admit that, uh, so, you know, some other field sites take data on tablets. We have not gone there yet. Part of that is because we always feel like we can get more data with the handwritten notes than with the tablets. But it's also because we get routinely chased by elephants, probably about twice a month. And um, it's not uncommon if you're being chased by elephants to kind of in a really panicked moment, drop what you're holding um, and elephants will just destroy everything that you drop. So we have had not great luck with things like cameras and technology. Um, we've had a lot of things trampled. So it's easier to recover a clipboard of paper from an elephant charge than it is a destroyed tablet. But this is an example from 2014, and I just wanted to show it so that you could see the kind of detailed data that we have. Um, here, you know, at the first, you know, one of the first things in the morning, Johnny, AJ, his uh, two letter code, Johnny charges, chases, and then makes attack two on Yogi Bear with kicks and slaps, and Yogi flees screaming. So, this is a prolonged attack with contact. This is not surprising to me because nobody likes Yogi. He's a low ranking chimp that just seems to just bother everybody. Um, we have some health data with Yogi coughing. We have a copulation with screams. Uh, the female screamed and then darted away right after between Lonjo and Rwanda. That lasts a whopping eight seconds. That's one second longer than the average where the female approached. And then we have things like intergroup interactions where the chimps hear calls from the neighboring group and they respond aggressively with their own wah barks. But throughout this hand, these handwritten narratives, we kind of, you might not realize it, but there's data on who's in a party together, who is sitting next to each other, who's grooming each other, who's being aggressive, and every type of moment that you have. Um, and in total, we have uh, over 110,000 hours of behavioral data on 160 individuals. And I think in many ways that it, it's, um, you know, for, for those of you who study humans, this is a really different kind of data set than what you're able to collect on humans. I mean, certainly there are these long-term longitudinal studies of humans so we can track their aging, but this is kind of like a day-to-day -day record of every one of those individuals over 35 years. And the kind of detail that we can get from studies of chimpanzees on their behavior really trumps anything that you could get on humans, both in terms of kind of the frequency of these events, but also the kind of detail that you can get. And so I always joke that, you know, like I know the average length of copulations for every single chimp that I study, and you would never know that for most of your friends or any of your study subjects. Um, and so, you know, there is this incredibly rich detailed data on this minute by minute scale that really trumps anything we can say about humans. And this is also just a good example of, you know, this is the soap opera. After we come home from the field at the end of the day and we're all having dinner together, the conversations we're having are really like you're describing the world's greatest soap opera. So it'll be, you know, oh my gosh, Johnny beat up Kakama and then he had sex with Kakama's mother right in front of him. And so it's just like, just incredibly rich social lives that these animals have. As I mentioned, we also do a lot of physiological data collection and we do this by collecting urine samples from the chimps. And this is our field assistant, John, kind of demonstrating the very technologically sophisticated urine catcher that we use, which is a long stick with a plastic bag stuck to it. And when the chimps are in the trees, they urinate, we can identify the chimp that's peeing, collect the pee, and then in our lab in New Mexico, we can assay that sample for testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, um, all of the kind of reproductive hormones. Chimps and humans are so similar physiologically that we can actually use human pregnancy tests on female chimpanzee urine to see if they're pregnant. So we can look at HCG. Um, we can measure cortisol, insulin, creatinine, thyroid hormone. A lot of this tells us about stress and energy, things like muscle mass can look at oxidative stress and we have some kind of data looking at aging and oxidative stress. We can look at salt, although they don't have salt in their urine. So it's not really, it's kind of a moot point. 
Um, and we're working on other things like health markers, like getting uh, assays for C-reactive protein going. I'm gonna, I hope none of you are eating, but I'm gonna show a picture of poop. Um, we can also collect fecal samples. And here we can get uh, kind of measures about diet composition and food digestibility. We have a couple of, we have a paper looking at how kind of food digestibility changes with age. They certainly get a little bit worse at digesting their food as they get older. Um, but importantly, it's from the fecal data that we get measures of parasite and viral loads, um, as well as DNA data. So we can figure out aspects of paternity. Um, since female chimps actually mate promiscuously, we don't know who the fathers are unless we have a DNA sample from the baby. We do things, just kind of genetic questions about things like malarial resistance genes. And uh, kind of a new area that we're exploring is trying to look at DNA methylation as a measure of aging to see if we can kind of look at how your genes are aging relative to your actual age. And this is something that's been done in other primates. Um, I think doing field work is sometimes kind of, you have to be really creative and, and, and think really hard about how you wanna get your data in a non-invasive way, since we do not dart our animals routinely unless there's a real medical emergency that a human has caused. So we can't get things like body weight, but we have developed techniques like using parallel laser photogrammetry to measure um, body size. So here's an example of two lasers that are a known distance apart. We shine them on the body of the chimp and we can measure how long they are. So we can get detailed data on growth. And we also have this incredibly big data set of pictures of baby chimps with their mouths open so we can track things like dental development. And for those of you who are interested potentially in brain growth, um, we certainly do have photos of the lasers on like the back of their head so we can look at how um, head shape and size is changing with age in this wild population. So let's, now that you know the kind of data that we collect, I wanna focus more in on the, the work that we have been doing on social aging in our population of chimps. And I wanna start by first going over um, what do humans do as we age? What is the human social aging phenotype? And many of you are probably familiar with uh, this kind of, this, this study. It's one of my favorite studies. Now it's almost 12 years old from 2010. But what they did here is in a kind of meta-analysis of over 140 studies and totaling 300,000 people, they looked at the different mortality risk factors. And what they found was actually, I think at the time, rather surprising, but that um, individuals who had high social, high scores for social relationships and social integrations, complex measures of social integration, that that social behavior had an incredibly protective effect on your mortality. That in many ways, the kind of being socially integrated increased your odds of survival between 50 and 90%. And that was not just comparable to other measure, like other risk factors, so giving up smoking or not drinking, but it actually exceeded it. So, you know, that, that having friends or being integrated into society had this protective effect on your mortality that was twice as much as giving up drinking. And so, you know, I always joke that obviously the, the lesson that you should take from this paper is that you should, you could definitely smoke and drink. You just have to do it with friends. And it probably like just wipes, you know, th those two things wipe each other out. I mean, I'm not, I'm joking, of course, but What's interesting is that these kinds of studies of the importance of social relationships have been replicated in, um, in primates. So we know that baboons who have complex, you know, kind of increased sociality scores also have increased uh, survival. But there's more, so we know that social, so, sociality is important to humans and has this protective effect, but there are these other important and interesting aspects of our social aging phenotype. One is that in certain ways, it's a little bit puzzling and people don't always think about this, but humans, as we age, actually become much more positive. We show a positivity bias. And I think it's funny because we often have this view of like grumpy old people. And I would say that my mother is not the best example of uh, positivity increasing with age, but that is the general phenotype as we age. We also know that across multiple studies that social networks of older people shrink 
but that actually older people report much more satisfaction with their relationships. Um, and so individuals as they age become much more selective about who they are spending time with. Now, um, psychologists have put forward that this pattern, this pattern is kind of called socio-emotional selectivity. And this has become this, this kind of paradigm of socio-emotional selectivity or SES has become the dominant explanation for shifts in cognition and behavior during aging. And the idea with socio-emotional selectivity is that when you are young, you are actually in this part of your life when you need to seek information. You're looking at the world, you're trying to figure out how to behave and what will be, you know, who should you spend time with for your best interests. And so you have to gather information. And to do that, you have to make connections and have a big social network to try to figure out how you live your life. As you get older, you have all the information you need about who you need to spend time with, what's best for you. And so as you get older, rather than focusing on the needs you have for information, you focus on just regular, like just emotional regulation and feeling good and spending time with individuals who are positive. So you have this shift towards positivity and you have selectivity towards friendships and relationships that are more positive. Now, socio-emotional selectivity, kind of that, that's the pattern. And that is why, you know, they, they kind of talk about that this shift between information and emotion is what's driving that pattern. But socio-emotional selectivity is grounded in the idea that humans can monitor time and have a knowledge of our mortality. And so the idea with um, emotional regulation is, as you get older in socio-emotional selectivity, as you get older and you have a sense of a time horizon, and of course death is the ultimate time horizon, you start thinking, well, I just wanna spend time with, with people that make me feel good and with my positive relationships. Now, so that actually is really interesting. And it made us think, well, if this is grounded, if socio-emotional selectivity theory is grounded in a human's ability to monitor time, understand time horizons, and have a knowledge of our mortality, then chimps should be different because chimps actually don't have the same, they can't monitor time in the same way that humans can. And this has been done in experiments where their ability to kind of understand time is much more on the order of a few hours or maybe a day. They don't have this kind of, there's never been shown that they can monitor time in the same way that humans can. And although it's very hard to show whether or not an animal has a knowledge of mortality, I would say that most of the data and anecdotes about chimps would suggest that they don't understand when individuals die. Like I, I, you know, I think that there are anecdotes that people read about, oh, but they seem so sad when an individual died. There are an equal number of anecdotes that would suggest that they don't really understand this concept. And so for the studies that I'm gonna tell you about, um, we kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to, to see if chimpanzees have the same kind of pattern in terms of their social aging? And if chimps and humans, and I'll just say this is my father, who I, I know does not look positive. He was actually a very positive person later in life, but he was, he just, he seems grumpy all the time. He moved from India to Canada when he was in the 60s and he was just cold. He was just cold the rest of his life. Um, but the, the idea with the studies that I'm going to talk to you about are that if chimps and humans show the same pattern and chimps are doing this without a knowledge of time and mortality, then I think we have to reassess the key assumption that you have to have this understanding of time horizons to show this pattern, that there may be other ways or mechanisms, neural mechanisms that are happening that would result in this same pattern. If chimps and humans show a different pattern, then this does provide comparison, comparative support for the theory. So um, we actually did this study and we published it in Science. And I just wanna say that this is very much a collaboration with Alex Rosati at the University of Michigan. She's a psychologist who studies animal behavior and um, chimps. And so this is very much a joint, a joint product. And to do this, we used uh, 
you know, over 20 years of data from male chimpanzees ranging in age from 15 to 58. We focused on males because they have kind of the richer social lives. So we could get a lot more data on these subjects, but I'll tell you about females towards the end. And the first thing we wanted to look at were what were the general patterns of social aging? So do chimpanzees actually show behavioral shifts with aging that might actually look like a positivity bias? And I will just say, it's a good time to just say, it's it can be very hard to you know look at a human study and then think about how do we get similar kinds of data from, from chimps where we can't ask them questions, we can't ask them how they're feeling. So we have to, in many ways, kind of approximate what what we think of as a positivity bias. And so one of the things we did was we looked at what we kind of consider a positive behavior like grooming, and we looked how that compared to negative behaviors like aggression. And so one of the things you can see in grooming is that grooming actually stay, it increases slightly, but it stays relatively consistent with age. When you look at aggression, which are the red and the orange bars, uh, what you see is a negative effect of age. So that as individuals get older, you see a decrease in uh, directed aggression, which is aggression against a particular target versus and non non-directed aggression, which is just kind of displays and you know throwing things around and going crazy. So grooming stays constant with age, aggression decreases with age. And so what you get when you think about these two different kinds of behaviors together is essentially kind of a net positive that, you know, they're decreasing their negative behaviors and maintaining their positive behaviors so that you're overall seeing this positivity bias as we would see in humans. So do social relationships shift with age? Well, like many primates, what we see is that older males are more solitary. So they do spend time in parties of one or by themselves more often. Now this is a very slight difference. So the difference is something like, you know, male, older males are alone, something like 93% of the time and younger males are alone 97% of the time. So they're still quite social, but there is a slight increase in being solitary. And this may do, be due partly to the constraints of aging just the physical constraints of maybe not being able to keep up or walk as quickly. Um, so we're, we're not sure that's something that we would have to explore a little bit more. When males are social, what we wanted to look at is whether or not they kind of were more drawn to bigger parties. And in many ways, I'm going to show you data categorically where the ages are broken up in categories. We did this both categorically as well as continuously. And I've also broken down males into rank because dominance rank does pattern much of male behavior. And what you can see is that even though males might have, as they age, older males might be more likely to be solitary, slightly more likely to be solitary, when they are social, they're more likely to be drawn to larger parties or they're at least in larger parties. So in many ways, they're more, they spend more time alone, but when they are social, they're kind of more social. We can also look at how often they sit next to each other. I'm not gonna go into the metrics, but these are kind of how often are, are males kind of sitting in close proximity to one another. And again, one of the things you can see is that older adults are more likely to sit near other males. So they're more likely to be in large parties and when they're in those large parties, they're sitting in closer proximity to each other. Now, one of the things that we can do with our data is calculate kind of friendship. So these are individuals who spend more time in spatial proximity to each other than the other males and the other kind of male dyads. And one of the things that we and we could do is look at mutual friends versus lopsided friends. And mutual friends are the ones who are both kind of sitting next to each other more than their own individual averages. And lopsided friends, I kind of liken to those younger siblings who are, you know, I'm always going to approach my older sibling and then he's going to move away and go hang out with his friends. So I'm always trying to be friends with him, but he doesn't really reciprocate that behavior. And one of the things that we found is that as male age, as male as males age, they actually increase the number of mutual friends relative to lopsided friends. So these are in many ways these kind of 
mutually and reciprocal relationships. And as you, as a male chimp gets older, they focus more of their attention on the individuals that are reciprocating those actions. And when you're, everyone has about the same number of friends, everyone has about four friends, but if you're older, your friends are ones that reciprocate that behavior. So I would also just like to point out that everyone seems to have a preference to be friends with older individuals. So even these prime age adults who are, you know, between the age of like 20 and 35, they are also drawn to older adults. And um, these are the proportions of mutual friends. When you look at lopsided friends, these young adults have more lopsided friends, but they want to be friends with these older adults. So everyone seems to be particularly drawn to older individuals. And they have this kind of social capital that I find really interesting and we can certainly talk about uh, a little bit later. So lastly, we want to see do males, do older males change their investment? And just quickly, we can look at uh, investment in a relationship by thinking about grooming. So this action of like doing this nice behavior to somebody else. And we actually see that everybody grooms their mutual friends more. And the thing to remember here is that these older adults have more mutual friends. So they're, in, they're spending more time kind of grooming their friends than these younger adults who don't have as many mutual friends. So everyone grooms mutual friends more, but these older adults have more mutual friends. So a good chunk of their social time is grooming those mutual friends. And we can look at things like not just time spent grooming, but how equal their grooming is. And so mutual friends are more equitable in their grooming. They reciprocate more um, across bouts as across, and, and across the year. So when we watch wild chimps behave, it's really common to see these two older adults sitting on the ground. These are two of the oldest males in our community, uh, Makoku on the left and Big Brown on the right. And they're just hanging out and being pretty calm with one another. So the reason that I think some of this is interesting, that older males seem to be attractive and maintaining these high degrees of sociality is that older males are not the highest ranking. And in fact, male rank, dominance rank, which correlates to reproductive success in chimpanzees, declines with age. So male chimps reach about peak rank by about 30. And then there's this slow decline with age so that some of our oldest individuals are kind of mid to low ranking. So being the fact that other individuals are attracted to them is not because they're the highest ranking individuals in the group. We also know that they are losing that kind of physical prowess. So we have data on creatinine that their muscle mass peaks at about 30 and then there's a slow decline. So they're not, they're not the strongest individuals in the group. We know that their testosterone peaks at something like 20 to 25, and then there's another slow decline. And since this makes sense, since testosterone and muscle mass are correlated with each other, it's not surprising to see these kinds of relationships. But interestingly, we don't necessarily see a deficit in reproduction. And if we look at the almost 40 infants that we know who the fathers are, over about a quarter of them are sired by some of our older males. We also know that copulation rates, whether it's with the sexy Paris females who are older and have already had babies or the not as sexy, attractive nulliparous females who are kind of younger, copulation rates actually don't decrease with age. I know it looks like maybe there's a slight decrease here, but actually that's not significant. So even though these older males have lost rank, lost testosterone, lost muscle mass, they're still able to sire infants and maintain high rates of copulation. So to some, what we think, what we found is that yes, male chimps are showing a positivity bias. Their aggression decreases, but grooming remains similar. They do seem to show shifts in social behavior with age. They're, they're a little bit more often solitary, but when they are social, they have this preference for larger parties. They have, they sit near other males and they have this shift towards these more 
uh, reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationships. And they do have, like I said, they, they groom their mutual friends more and they have more mutual friends. So in many ways, we're seeing very similar shifts in chimpanzee aging as we see in humans. So male chimps are exhibiting that positivity bias. And even though they're lacking social status, they're maintaining high quality relationships despite their decreasing rank and even maintaining reproductive success. So what we conclude in, this, in these studies is that there is a shift towards positive affiliation and selectivity that's happening in the absence of a sense of, in, of, a sense of more, mortality. And so it seems likely that you can get that same kind of social aging phenotype, but perhaps there's something else going on. And the argument that we make in the paper that would still need to be tested is that as chimpanzees and humans age, there seems to be at least a shared ability to regulate our emotions better that might explain why we see some of these patterns. I just wanna say that this seems a little bit different from what other primates are doing. So including uh, macaques who are kind of the main study species for aging in primates. Um, most primates do show age-related declines in sociality, but what you see in most primates is actually a negativity bias where they decrease their grooming behavior, but maintain their aggressive behavior. And there have been studies about selectivity, but they're pretty, the evidence for any sort of selectivity is pretty limited and seems to show slightly different patterns than what we're seeing in chimpanzees. So just to end, you know, we do have a lot of kind of follow-up questions with this kind of research. You know, what is the function? Like, why are these friendships so important for older males? And we think what's happening is that um, these friendships mean that older males can form coalitions with each other, coalitionary aggression. And that's actually how they're maintaining their reproductive success by being able to fight together for access to females. Um, we have a current grant to look at how friendships are mediating the stress response so that maybe if you have friends and you're with those friends, you don't have quite the same stress response to a stimulus. And that overall that has a beneficial outcome and that might be what's explaining why social behavior has this positive effect on survival. And then of course, what about females? And I'll just say we have done a little bit of the work with females already. And uh, in a social network analysis, we showed that females do show different patterns of social aging. Um, and so you actually see that they show kind of decreases of being in, like they're just not as embedded in grooming networks with age. And this seems to suggest that maybe there are aspects of kind of sex differences in social aging. It's not necessarily a topic that's talk, that is shown so much in the human literature, although there is evidence for uh, sex differences in human social aging where males seem particularly drawn to kind of uh, spouses and friends as they age, but females tend to form stronger bonds with their adult children as they age. So there might be some evidence for sex differences that needs to be worked out a little bit. So overall, I'm just gonna finish with kind of some of the big lessons that we can learn with it from this. Well, I wouldn't like to make the pitch for the value of long-term research. When Richard started our site in 1987, he never thought, okay, well, yeah, in 35 years, we're gonna do a study of socio-emotional selectivity, but the richness of our data set allows us to ask questions that we don't even know we have yet. And I'd like to make a pitch that these long-term field sites, and there are several dozen of them across the apes, um, are incredibly valuable research tools for questions we don't even know we have yet. And I think it also reminds me this kind of work that there can be these incredible intersections between natural and social sciences. This project kind of came up because I had coffee with Alex, who's a psychologist, and she said, oh, do you know anything about socio-emotional selectivity theory? I was like, never heard of it. Um, but that there are, because we have these rich data sets, we can start to ask questions at the intersection of psychology, neuroscience, behavior, that are kind of new and exciting. And so with that, I went a little bit over time, but hopefully there's time for questions. I just wanna say, you know, this work takes, I mean, we have hundreds of hundreds of thousands of hours of data and effort that goes into this. So a huge thank you to our field staff who go out every day and collect this. 
to my collaborators, and then especially to our funders who have funded this work for 30, over 35 years, and in particular this research, which was funded by the NIH here in the United States. And so if anyone has questions, I'm gonna uh, stop my screen share so I can see all of you. Here we are. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, you didn't see that because people just sent to me to not disturb you, but the chat was on fire. Oh, good. <laughs> there's okay. There's questions, there's praise. Everyone loved it. Oh, good. So thank, well, you. I, thank you so much. I think chimps are sometimes a very easy thing to get people hooked, right? I mean, they're so interesting. And just one video of a chimp, most people are like, oh, that's cool. It's, it's also the combination. So it's the amazing wealth of data that you have. Obviously, the exciting fieldwork aspect, but also your style of presentation oh. made it <laughs> well, even more like fun it. than just having the data. So, wow. Oh. Um, there was a couple of questions in the chat. I would just give the floor to the people who asked them because I was getting quite a lot of messages from you. Um, you might just want to unmute and ask the question directly because I can't find them anymore. <laughs> Valentina, go for it. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. In, indeed, uh, the videos were just so captivating. Um, so my question was, um, have you noticed, have you started any difference in terms of behavior um, between the on-ground and on the tree environment uh, mm -hmm. i was thinking maybe because of the degrees of freedom they have that are different and if this then affects the sociability between the uh, the animals and uh, the following results that you showed us yeah um there are behave different behaviors between the tree and the ground so we do tend to see more uh, grooming and aggression on the ground than in the trees. So the, the time spent in trees is mostly dominated by feeding behavior. That's why they're usually up in the trees. They certainly do groom and are, can be aggressive in the tree, but I think aggression particularly, you know, I mean, there's a risk of falling out of the tree and it's maybe a little bit more stable on the ground to do that. Uh, so chimps have kind of a very specific diurnal pattern. They go, they feed first thing in the morning, then they'll travel to another feeding patch. They tend to do a lot of resting on the ground mid afternoon. And so that's when you tend to see these like long grooming bouts and then people start getting on each other's nerves and there's aggression. I think the other thing about the, it, that's hard to capture from our perspective is that the visibility in the tree versus on the ground is probably quite a bit different. So when they're up in the trees, they have these long views and they can probably see other chimps coming or other ch things that are going on for quite a long distance. When they're on the ground, especially in particular parts, they're, it can be really scrubby and they can hide from each other and they can like, you know, they might, some places they might have really good visibility, but others they don't. And so you can get things like sneaky copulations where a male can just come in and have a copulation with a female and nobody knows about it, <laughs> right? And that's not going to be as easy in a tree. Mm -hmm. So there, there are probably differences in what they can see and, um, you know, kind of monitoring what everybody can see that okay. might find me interesting. So I guess most part of your studies on, on friendship and, and grooming up, up and on the ground. Well, a lot of that behavior is on the ground, but in this study, we took everything. So if there was aggression or grooming in the trees, it would have been recorded. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Patrick has a question as well. Yes, thanks so much for this amazing presentation. Um, the data and the wealth of the data is just really very impressive. And I had, uh, by the way, really such a good time listening to your talk. Oh, so thank you. I was, I was wondering, at one point you mentioned that uh, chimpanzees um, or in chimpanzee communities, um, individuals can just avoid seeing each other for quite a long time. Is this due to the, I assume, rather big size of the community and other primates don't have such big communities? Or, or would you say a community of 60 is like really an, a huge 
community of, of chimpanzees that don't have any. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. so the average community size for chimpanzees is about 50 individuals. So we are, it's actually funny when we talk about Kanyuara, we are extraordinarily average. We're extraordinarily ordinary across all these metrics of chimp behavior. Um, the really big community, you know, I think if you have over 150 individuals in a community, that would be considered very large. Something like under 20 would be very small, but 50 is about average. And in terms of how that might compare to other primates, you know, macaques and baboons can certainly live in groups of comparable size. I think the difference with like when you are following a macaque group or a baboon group, you're following the whole troop is together all the time. They're feeding together, they're sleeping together, they're in visual proximity 100% of the time. Because, you know, we, we kind of think that because of the way that food dis is distributed in chimp habitats and also because they're larger bodied and have reduced predation pressure, we don't have chimp predators in our habitat other than humans, that they're comfortable or they're able to just go off by themselves without that need for protection of the group. And so it's very, you know, I mean, I think I had data sets from my PhD where I was looking in two year chunks of how females were interacting with each other. And there was, there were several female dyads who did not interact with each other in two years. Now they're all part of the community and they might interact with other chimps. And so we know that they're all there and they're being seen and they're alive. They just never saw each other that, or that we never recorded them seeing each other. And there are some chimps who we might not see for six months and we think, oh my gosh, he must be dead. And then all of a sudden, you know, he crests over a hill with the sunlight behind him and you're like, oh, you're back. And we're, we, we actually call it walkabout. We say, oh, he must have been on a walkabout. We've, and, you know, it's a little bit of a mystery. Ah, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the really interesting and cool talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have two questions. One is related to what Patrick just asked, and the other one is about the cohort effect, actually. <laughs> Um, so the first question is about uh, females, because since the study it's mainly males, uh, I was wondering because in fish and fusion societies, females tend to leave uh, the groups as well, right? Like they are the ones who, where the, all the uh, they, fusion yeah. happens, uh, right? So I'm wondering how you, like when you studied or when you follow the chimp group for, um, you said 35 years, right? Um, how do you have like a constant, um, uh, I was wondering because in fish and fusion, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. What's up with the, with the screen? So yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering whether you have data on like who left or who might mm -hmm. come back, who, um, yeah. How do you follow that? So I should just clarify. So it's fission fusion are these like temporary changes over the, over the course of even a day or a few hours. And females are more likely to be alone, but they certainly, it, it's equally likely, I think, that a male might leave a small party and come back. And the difference for females is that they're not phylopatric. So they leave the group that they're born in. I think we had a little Zoom bomber there. <laughs> in act. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was, um, anyway. Um, I think the biggest difference is that females are not philopatric. So they leave the community that they're born into around 12. And then we never see them again. Right. So we have these females that are born, they leave. There are, and then we get, we get these stranger females show up who are about 12 years old and we don't know where they came from. So we don't, I mean, it's a real, one of the great mysteries in chimpology is where are these females going? And you know why are they making decisions to join our group, for example? So there is we we don't have for most of our females we don't have data on the early years of their life. Um, what's interesting is that there are multiple study sites in the forest that I work in, and so every so often we get a female that's totally habituated to humans, and we'll take what we do is we take her picture and we send it to the other research sites and we say, is this one of yours? And almost always mm -hmm. it is. So that's kind of cool. So we can get that kind of history. Um, and we do actually have, I think we have three females who are born in the group who never left, who just decided to stay and have babies in our group. 
And they're almost always high ranking, the daughters of high ranking females. So I think they're just like, I have it good here. I'm not leaving to be a low ranking female somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of their social behavior, their social behaviors are different because they have their moms in their group with them often, or they have at least one of our females has a sister in the group. And so they have this very tight knit family kind of situation that's very different from other females. Okay. Cool, super interesting, thanks. And the other question is about cohort effects. So you stressed uh, the benefit of studying chimpanzee groups because they don't show uh, the same cohort effects as for example, like humans with all the social media and so on. I was wondering whether uh, climate change might have introduced mm -hmm. cohort effects uh, in the past uh, few decades, like if yeah. you have data from 35 years, mm -hmm. um, is there for example, a food resource that has gone extinct um, over this period of time, which has- yes, sir, yeah. Influenced. It's a great something. question. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I shouldn't say we have no co cohort effects. We certainly have some cohort effects. So just, you know, who the alpha male is when you're born might be a cohort effect compared right. to, you know, another alpha male when someone else is born. So we do have these cohort effects. They're just not kind of these worldwide cohort effects in the same in the same way that we have with humans. Um, in terms of climate change, we do have interesting data that the forest has changed over the 35 years that we've been working there. Uh, incredibly, the temperature in our field site has gone up four degrees Celsius over 30 years, which is an incredible change over 30 years. What's interesting is that it seems to have had a somewhat positive effect on food resources for the community. So we actually have data that suggests that there are more like abundant food resources for the chimps, which probably correlates with um, what we've shown is that the chimpanzee birth rate has increased over 30 years. And we think that's a direct result of this increase in resource. But we also have studies done by other people in the forest that show that at a nutritional level, things like leaves in the forest have actually changed their macronutrient composition so that the fiber in leaves has increased 13% and the protein content of leaves has decreased 6%. So there are lots of different kinds of changes that we think are associated with climate change. And right now we're seeing kind of this positive effect of maybe having an impact of increasing resources but it's not probably sustainable. And if the temperature continues to increase, I think we're gonna see kind of more periods of drought in the forest, which will have a negative effect. How that's changed social behavior, we certainly see kind of bigger groups than what we had seen in the past. Um, and I should just say one of the ways that we control for this in these models is by putting year in as a random effect to try to control for some of that change over time that, um, that might be due to climate change. <clears throat> okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And sorry for the disruption. We now close the door. Um, <laughs> questions. I had two questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one is that you mentioned that the oldest chimp that um, you know of was 62, if I'm not mistaken. And that was a female. And I was wondering if that is similar to humans where women tend to outlive men. Is that a common pattern or was that just a coincidence that the oldest? I mean, it, it tends to be the pattern that female chimps have a, a increased lifespan compared to males. So I would say, you know, female chimp lifespans are maybe 45 to 55 and males are maybe 40 to 50, although we have several individuals who live past 50. And I think a lot of that is due to just increased mortality when they're younger, not necessarily kind of that they're they're that female chimps are living longer once they get to 50. But you know, male chimps are dying of they're they're getting killed by their neighbors, they're engaging in kind of risky or physical behaviors, um, especially things that might expose them to disease more often. Um, so they do have increased mortality that does kind of reduce their average lifespan. But um, I would say in gen, and I, you know, I have to, you have to be a little bit cautious of some of these older individuals were estimating their ages mm -hmm. because we didn't necessarily know the birth year of all of them. Although we have some pretty good data because they were studied before we started our study site in 87. So 
Um, we feel pretty confident for our older individuals between like around, like, you know, they're 50, give or take two to five years. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily, it, so yes, it's true, but you know, with humans, the data is also that just males have kind of increased mortality and in younger, you know, like they also just die at young ages and that kind of takes down the average lifespan. Uh, and and I, second, I, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Stephanie, go ahead. The second question I have for you, so you, you said you can identify all your Tims by their appearance and their behavior. Um, and well, not their, by their like physical characteristics, like their physical, hair. Okay. Yeah. And you, you gave all of them names, right? Mm -hmm. How do you choose their names? It's a fierce battle across all of us who do the research. <laughs> so, um, so we have some rural naming conventions, which are kind of consistent across field sites. So if you have a female who has a name uh, that starts with a particular letter, then her babies usually get a letter with the same first initial. And that's so that we can track family groups. So if we, you know, we're, you know, it's easy. Oh, that's the P family or she's a member of the P family. Um, within that, we might have kind of just, they're not jokes, but we just have like, you know, little conventions. So, um, we had a, we had a female named Nile and in Uganda, there's a beer called Nile special. So when she had a baby, we named the baby special and then special actually is one of those females that stayed in the community. And so all of her babies have been named after beer or alcohol. So we have her baby is Stella and then her other baby is Spay. Like we just, you know, I mean, you just, you just have a little bit of fun with it within the rules. Um, and we fight a lot about it. So um, we had a female that we had a male that needed a B name and I was like absolutely adamant that it should be named Bieber and no one agreed with me because we have a female chimp named Gaga and I really wanted Bieber and Gaga to have a love child together <laughs> 20 years and it, it's just never going to happen now. So <laughs> that sounds um, like long nights of discussions. Oh yeah, lots of emails, lots of emails back and forth. <laughs> um, and I did want to actually just in, just interrupt the questions and say I know many of you are interested in neuroanatomy, and I will say that you know one of the challenges for us is that we don't have great data on their brains, right? So if a chimp dies, we might be able to recover the body, but even getting an intact brain in a necropsy in a tropical jungle after like hours of decomposition really sucks. It's really, really hard to do. Um, we have a lot of captive studies where people have recovered brains and been able to look at patterns of aging. So we know that work has been done to show that there are kind of declines in neuron numbers across different parts of the brain. Um, we know that there are kind of share, some shared aspects in terms of Alzheimer's phenotypes and brain kind of structures, but it's, it's a real, you know, getting, going from behavior to actual kind of neurobiology and neuroanatomy in the wild is one of those things that I think right now is just too difficult. We're just not there yet to make those connections. Do you think that would be a prospect on the horizon or is that forever too difficult to achieve? No, I, I mean, I think at, at every time a chimp dies, which is a very, it's actually a very sad event for us, you can imagine. Um, we do, if we can collect the fresh body, we try to get a necropsy done as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And part of our protocols are to sample as many tissues as possible and put them in RNA later and like all sorts of preservation material. Um, in the, in the field, getting at the brains can be hard because just sawing through the crania is quite challenging. And you have to understand we're doing these necropsies kind of under a tent stand in a rainforest in full PPE, sweating profusely and it's raining and it's dark and you're like, it's just, and you're so sad and it sucks and it's gross. And um, it's not kind of the sterile conditions you're thinking it might be. Um, and the brain is usually the last thing that we're able to get. Um, and so we do have some brain tissue samples that are in RNA later. I mean, I think it'll depend on whether or not the questions you're asking require full complete brains that are intact or whether 
some of the questions could be answered by just some neural tissue or neurons and you know what you might be interested in um and you know i will say that cap captive and wild chimps do lead very different lives both in terms of social behavior but also health outcomes and diets and so a, a wild chimp brain might be very different from a captive chimp brain there's, there's definitely a lot that's left to explore yes <laughs> um Thank you so much. I'm, I'm aware we're slightly over time now, so um, I'm going to release everyone. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And I'll definitely be in touch uh, oh, offline. Yes, <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. you so much. And apologies again. I'm going to clean up the recording. So you're going to have a nice <laughs> recording to share. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>